we're just going to start out. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Hal Roth, and I direct contemplative studies um, at Brown, and um, I have a longstanding interest in classical Chinese philosophy and religion, and particularly contemplative practices. And uh, the theories of qi um, and vital energy in many ways originate in one of the texts that I've devoted a large section of my life to called the Huinanza. So um, I would like to uh, uh, welcome you all. This is a this is the informal meet and greet part. So uh, we just like to get uh, to know one another a little bit and check in with who's here. And then 5:30 is the formal start of the lecture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go around since uh, somebody needs to be the coordinator um, and somebody's uh, screen in this virtual world uh, needs to be. Um, the uh, coordinator's uh, touch base. I'm going to go around my screen and ask different people to introduce themselves um, uh, just briefly as we've uh, as we've requested. So I'm going to start with Stephanie. So hi everybody. Uh, I'm Stephanie Jones, and it's a, it's a real pleasure to meet you all virtually. Um, I'm one of the co-organizers of the workshop, and I am an associate professor in the neuroscience department here at Brown University. And I'm really looking forward to hopefully getting to know you all better over the course of the year and the series of um, lectures that we'll be having. So just to tell you a bit about my lab, my lab studies um, sensory perception and motor action in humans. And we do this with a combined approach that measures human brain activity non-invasively with a technique called MEG, magno magnetoencephalography, which many of you may know of, um, and also EEG. And we combine this with computational neural modeling methods, where our methods are designed to interpret the neural mechanisms underlying these non-invasively measured human signals um, and changes in these signals that occur across conditions or populations and try to understand how those changes emerge in the neural circuits. And I have a history of collaborative work with Kathy and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that before we introduce our speaker today. So I'm gonna hold off on giving you any more detail about my relationship with Kathy and some more details of the work. But uh, again, it's, it's a real pleasure to meet you all and I'm looking forward to learning more about what you do. Thanks, Steph. Um, uh, Chloe, could you please introduce yourself? I am Chloe, I'm an MD PhD student and I'm starting the PhD portion in neuroscience in Stephanie's lab. Um, I was working with Kathy Kerr originally on a clinical trial with Qigong um, compared to exercise and we've continued that work in Stephanie's lab. Um, and I'm looking at different aspects of it for my PhD. Thanks, Chloe. Uh, Laura Regan. Hi, yeah, I'm Laurie, and I wouldn't have said this before Stephanie and Chloe's introductions, but in a former career, I was a neuroscientist. And um, Julie Cower was one of my roommates in college. <laughs> so you probably know her as a neuroscientist at Brown. Um, but I ended up going to naturopathic school at Natu National University of Natural Medicine and have ended up formally as the dean of the uh, college that Heiner founded and I'm currently a faculty in that program with a focus on teaching Qigong. So I'm very happy right, to thank be you, here. Laurie. Hi. Uh, Chris, Chris Moore. Hi, um, <clears throat> I'm Chris Moore. I'm a professor of neuroscience and I'm the associate director of our Kearney Institute at Brown, which is an institute that tries to connect different domains that may have perspectives to bear on the mind and brain. Um, my research, uh, I work, have worked a lot with Steph. I, uh, that's my oven. Uh, I was, uh, in quotes, Kathy's postdoc mentor, but I'd say that in quotes because I think Steph was more of a mentor. I was more of an agitator uh, to <laughs> Catherine's vision. Um, but we did work on things like MBSR and brain dynamics and how that goes to mindfulness based. And also <clears throat> at about the time that I moved to Brown, Kathy did also, so we were able to continue a, a nice degree of contact over that time. So um, one of the interests of my lab that dovetails here is I'm very interested in how non-neural systems in the body 
are probably playing a very active role in cognition, which you know is a very embodied mind kind of point of view for those of you for whom that's a good reference. Um, but we're very actively going towards doing research in those sorts of areas. Thank you, Chris. Um, our, our guest uh, this evening is Heiner. Um, we will formally introduce Heiner at 5.30, but Heiner, any uh, self-introduction uh, that you'd like to do? Uh, your, uh, your audio is uh, off. Well, uh, thanks first for enticing me to engage in this project and do the uh, research for that. It's like I'm a, a, a sinologist, just like Hal by training originally. Uh, specialty originally was Chinese literature, uh, but then due to a personal health crisis as a young man, I went back to China for a second time and uh, mostly for self-healing purposes. I studied Chinese medicine and stayed another few years. And then when I came back, I, I, I stayed in that field. Uh, and after founding the College of Classical Chinese Medicine at the university that uh, Lori uh, is teaching as well, the National University of Natural Medicine in Portland, uh, I've been in that field for the last uh, 30 years or so. And uh, Dealing with qi, everything I do is about qi, but uh, it was nevertheless extremely interesting for me to try and organize it in some, some fashion here for this presentation. And it wasn't as easy as I thought it would be because it's just too, <laughs> too big of a, everything in Chinese culture is about qi. And, uh, but my training, uh, different from Laurie and some of the people here, I'm, I'm glad to hear that there is such expertise in neuroscience here. My training is exclusively in the humanities. I'm, of course, a Chinese medicine practitioner, but tend to think less in Western medicine terms. So if I say anything that is unscientific, <laughs> please forgive me for that, since that is my... my uh, you know, the symbol science of the I Ching is sort of my personal specialty, other than the clinical practice of Chinese herbalism and Qigong. Thank you, Heiner. Um, I'll have to add here informally, I won't do this in the formal part, that Heiner also survived one of the most difficult personalities in early China studies um, in his uh, doctoral dissertation work in University of Chicago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so probably you and I are the only two people here who know who I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. But anyway, that's an accomplishment in and of itself. <laughs> um, Simona uh, Ibanescu. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Simona Temeranka Ibanescu. I am an assistant professor, uh, research track at Brown uh, University. Um, a main direction of uh, my research uh, focuses on the brain mechanisms of moving meditation uh, and in particular Qigong and how um, movement-based mind-body practices impact brain function and mental and physical health. Um, how uh, did I come to do this? Um, I uh, joined the Vitality Project about three years ago uh, which uh, Kathy started. Uh, and I have been knowing Kathy um, at Mass General. Uh, we are colleagues there. I am excited uh, to continue her work and uh, really excited to meet you all. Thank you, Simona. Um, Ken Cohen is up next. Okay. Zunjing, the Tongshirman, Pongyomen esteemed uh, friends and colleagues. It, it's an honor to be here with all of you. What a wonderful group. My name is Ken Cohen, and I've been involved in uh, Qigong, Taiji Chen, Taoism, and Chinese martial arts uh, since 1968. I was the only apprentice to Dr. Huang Gongshi, a Taoist abbot, a Lungmen sect Taoist abbot, who uh, was born in 1910, died in 1999. And I'm also quite interested in the interface between Western medicine 
and Qigong. As far as I know, I was the first person to lecture about Qigong in US medical schools. I advised the National Institutes of Health about Qigong research during the formation of the first Office of Alternative Medicine in the early 90s. And I was myself a research subject in the laboratories of Dr. Ed Wilson and later in the 12-year uh, project, Physical Fields and States of Consciousness conducted by the Menninger Institute. So I'm quite interested, it seems, in what you're all interested in. And again, it's an honor to be here with all of you. Thank you, Ken. Um, uh, Shamini, Jane. Hi, everyone. It's really wonderful to see old friends and new friends here. It's been a long time since I've seen some of you. Um, I started off actually in neuroscience and for my PhD work, I decided to move into a field called psychoneuroimmunology to look at things a little bit more systemically when we look at healing. So that's what my PhD background is in. I'm a, an assistant professor in psychiatry at UC San Diego and the founder and CEO of a collaborative called the Consciousness and Healing Initiative, which was really formed to support other researchers who are interested in consciousness and biofield science research, and now has expanded um, to share things with the community as well and provide educational resources. Thank you very much, Emily. Uh, Yun Jo. Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Xuan Yun Zhou. I'm from uh, uh, Wudang Mountain. I'm a priest. Also, I'm a Tai Chi teacher, Qigong teacher. And uh, yeah, also, now I'm living in New Hampshire. I have uh, my only daughter center in here. So thank you for having me here. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Zhou. Um, Maureen uh, Pelton, please um, introduce yourself. Hello, I see some familiar faces. I'm uh, Maureen and I am a social scientist and mental health practitioner. I knew Kathy. I was an advisor to the Vitality Program and a small funder. Um, and I got to know Chloe and uh, I'm really appreciative of the work that has been happening. And um, I am work with energy, subtle energy and biofield um science and as well as a number of modalities in um in uh the mental health world thank you maureen um srinivas ready hello everybody well i i really feel like I, what can, hello yes namaste i what can i say i feel like i, I mean i'm just tiny little ant amongst these giants of people um uh, but, uh, well, I, I teach in the Contemplative Studies Department at Brown because of one of my great gurus, um, Professor Harold Roth. So, um, I'll, in fact, that's all I can really say. Um, I studied with uh, Hal, uh, like, I don't know, 25 years ago, before all this was a thing. And, uh, you know, he had a dream and a vision, and it's been just a joy to watch that grow. And... Uh, the kind of thing, like even tonight, how, how can you have assembled such a um, constellation of, you know, just luminary people, you know, it's amazing. Um, I uh, <clears throat> work in South Asia. Uh, I studied sitar, formerly in the traditional way with my master for 12 years, Sri Partha Chatterjee, the student of Pandit Nikhil Banerjee, a great uh, maestro. And um, I did my PhD at Berkeley in South Asian studies. And uh, I studied under George Hart, great uh, Tamil scholar, and also probably my grand guru, you can actually see him right there, Padmanam S. Jaini, the living master of Buddhism and Jainism. I mean, he's amazing. He just turned 98. So God bless the gurus and thank you very much. Thank you, Sri. Very kind. Um, Jason Utopolis. Great, uh, wonderful to be with everybody this afternoon. Um, so by way of background, I followed uh, the work that Kathy and Chloe have been doing um, uh, for a little while now with uh, enthusiasm. I run uh, a foundation called the Emerald Gate Foundation based here in California. And we, uh, we fund research into areas like subtle energy 
uh, energy, energy medicine, uh, basically frontier sciences. And we look, we look to do so um, out of curiosity and we do so with a high bar uh, for rigor, the objective of learning as much as we can and helping catalytically uh, accelerate the, the progress in the, in the space. So it's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Jeff, hello, long time no see. Yeah, how are you? Good. Um, Jeff Walker, I, uh, I'm an old business guy, private equity guy that uh, turned good and, and uh, started working on social change, um, but also been, you know, 45 year meditator and Tai Chi practitioner. And, and uh, I spend my life putting together donor collaboratives, um, particularly focused on, you know, the changes we want to see. Um, the social changes. And I chair the Contemplative Science Center at the University of Virginia, the out, outside board, and uh, have been co-creating with Jason Yutuplos, a uh, donor collaborative in the subtle and healing energy space. And we have now um, eight partners who are looking to fund efforts in the space. Um, the first one probably be around imaging the electric, uh, the energy fields um, around the human body and try to add the science that we've done in the mindfulness world uh, over the years to, uh, to this, this segment of, uh, of examination. So uh, love being with you all and, and finding people to co-create with. Thank you, Jeff. I'm glad you could be here. Um, uh, Donald Wong, um, are you, is your uh, device working okay? And uh, your, your audio is not turned on. Okay, how about now? It's, uh, we can hear you, great. Okay, now if you can see me. <laughs> we can see um, you. Well, I, I have three hats. I'm a restaurateur, a state rep, and I teach um, martial art and Qigong. I started martial art and Qigong back in 1965, um, first under a monk, um, I studied Buddhism, and then another lady, I studied Taoism, and also Qigong, and um, the main teacher is was a monk, Lem San, who has passed away. I stayed with him for 10 years till he passed away. Um, the next person was Fung Ha, and he has also passed away. Um, he was in Berkeley, California, and he taught uh, Yi Chuan. And then the last one is Sifu Li, who's a teacher from um, China, which taught me a lot of Taoism to emit the chi and change molecules in water and um, using mantras and um, Sanskrit writing. Um, what I'm concerned about is um, for the last couple of years, Massachusetts has been trying to control some of um, of um, Eastern way of qigong and massages and things like that. Um, one of the bills that they had out was uh, a body work bill that we fought and we kept it from uh, being passed because that would have included qigong Tai Chi, yoga, um, any, and any touch with people. It might have even affected Reiki, which um, I think that we have to unify and try to keep this from happening. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. Um, Sarah Lazar. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Sarah. I'm um, a couple different hats as well. Uh, most of the time I'm at Mass General and um, I do research on um, yoga and meditation, mostly meditation, mostly MBSR, uh, <laughs> some you know, eight-week mindfulness programs. Um, and then for the last four years, I taught down at Brown in the spring. Actually, I inherited one of Kathy's classes. Um, and so uh, I've been teaching uh, the neuroscience of meditation for the last four years. A lot of fun, uh, really, really great. 
And I also collaborated with Kathy on a couple of projects, including one that just got published with Chloe earlier this year. You know, she's, she's been gone for years, but she's still publishing. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's um, you know, this is, this, you know, especially the neuroimaging is just in science in general, just it takes time to get things out. So mm -hmm. it'll be nice that we'll be seeing Kathy's name for a while. And as I say, this is almost the anniversary. I don't know if that was mentioned or not. So. <clears throat> No, we haven't, we haven't mentioned it, no. Yeah, so I don't know the exact, it's the 12th, I think, right? So, yeah, almost. Uh, anyways, so not to bring that up, but anyways, so uh, nice to see you all. Nice to see you too, uh, Sarah. Um, uh, we have uh, somebody who just joined us, uh, Dur Tung. Could you please say a few uh, short words of introduction? We have a few minutes left before the start of the lecture. Sure. Oh, it's you. It's me. Harrison. I yeah. didn't recognize your Chinese name. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm the director of the Dow Studies Institute in, in Seattle. Um, I guess I was somewhat responsible for some of the things that happened at the, in the study. Um, so. Yes, that's very succinctly put. A um, uh, couple of things. Uh, one person who's missing who um, uh, would ordinarily have been here with us is Larson D. Fiore. Um, Larson is, uh, uh, received his PhD in uh, religious studies and Chinese religions in the spring of 2018. He was one of my doctoral students. And he's also, over the years, uh, he was also somehow managed to uh, spend uh, his uh, undergraduate studies working with me and then uh, went away for a while and came back and did his PhD and so somehow tolerated me for all that length of time. Uh, he's also become a uh, practitioner and a teacher of Qigong and a very adept one. And he is one of the uh, people responsible for conceiving of this uh, lecture and seminar series. Uh, but um, he, um, his, he has a very elderly father who is not in good health and he needed to take him to the emergency room this evening. Um, so we're hoping that Larson will be able to join us uh, uh, but we're not, he's not at all sure, and we're not at all sure. Um, and of course, I would be uh, remiss, even though she would not like me to do this, if I, if I fail to introduce Ann Hireman Hart, um, who is the, the key administrator for contemplative studies, the program coordinator, um, and uh, the person who usually cracks the whip behind the scenes. And when she says, jump, everybody else here says, how high? Um, it's possible that not everybody knows about uh, the uh, wonderful project in which uh, Harrison was involved and Chloe was involved and Stephanie was involved. And so I'm going to ask uh, Chloe to say a few words about uh, the project, the research project, the Vitality Project, um, and uh, where things are at the moment. Uh, just to give uh, all of our guests uh, an understanding of that to which uh, Harrison has just referred. And this was uh, one of the, the heart projects. You know, Kathy gave me some very wise words, me who's involved with way too many things. Um, uh, she said that it's really important in life to pick out your heart project and stick with it. And that's exactly what she did and Chloe and Stephanie have been able to carry that on in wonderful ways. Um, so um, Chloe, could you say a few words about the research? Well, I actually, I think Steph is gonna go into a bit in the broader group. Oh, are you gonna talk about it in the introduction? Okay, great. I'm not gonna give any details, Chloe, about the data collection or any of that. And so maybe you wanna just tell people about, you know, everything that, that's been going on with the Vitality. I'm just gonna briefly introduce you introduce it because I don't want to take too much time out of the main lecture. Yeah, so so broadly, I mean, Kathy was, her whole focus was bodily intelligence and how do you actually measure that and, and generate it. Um, 
and her lens on it was through Qigong. And so the study was conceived with fatigued cancer survivors um, who sort of naturally have an experience of very low energy. Um, and looking at randomizing them to either a Qigong class or an exercise nutrition class, um, which is considered more of the gold standard for treating fatigue. Um, and we're in the early, we're getting close to um, having our results, but in general, it looks like both the Qigong was improving fatigue um, quite significantly and exercise also um, increased fatigue quite significantly. And so it sort of gets at this question of, um, you know, the different, different practices work for different people, but um, there could be a real interesting finding if Qigong is a much lower metabolic, much easier um, practice to take out for someone fatigued potentially um, to approach it from that lens. And um, Chloe, could you tell us where we are in terms of, um, I know you, you have one article that's, that's published? Uh, we have a preliminary article published that was done. It's a qualitative interview-based article um, that was done assessing how uh, fatigue cancer survivors describe fatigue in the body. Um, and then we have the, the paper that Sarah referred to, which wasn't with Qigong or with cancer, but it was with Tai Chi practitioners who experienced depression. Great. So I might just add a, a little bit more detail about the data that we have. We're, we're still actively analyzing this data because it was a big study. Um, and there were, there were brain measures of cognitive function and muscle control using EEG. There are blood measures to look at some um, changes in the blood and the immune system. There are heart rate measures. There are respiratory measures. Um, there are strength measures. And so this was a really big study um, that, that was undertaken by Chloe and Kathy and, and, and Simona now here is leading some of the EEG efforts for that study. And so it's, there's a lot still ongoing and we hope to have a few pu publications that come out of it. But part of what we'll talk about in this series over the year is some of the findings from that study, Great. Um, which has been really exciting, but challenging. So many challenges in that data and in the population and yeah. in the low end and everything else that we've had to deal with that we'll talk more about. I'd be curious um, where you might be going with the blood findings. I'll just share uh, one of the randomized control trials that I did was with fatigue breast cancer survivors where we looked at a hands-on healing intervention or a biofield healing intervention, and it was a placebo control trial. So our, we had three groups and the comparison group here was a very tightly rigorous, you know, sort of placebo control. One of the interesting findings that we had, which is the, the papers published in the journal Cancer, so happy to send to people if you wanna see it, um, was that for only for the healing group, we found um, regulations in cortisol variability, that is uh, normalization of the slope of cortisol throughout the day using, you know, kind of gold standard measures at that time of cortisol variability. One of the things we noticed when we looked at the blood work, however, because I don't know exactly how you um, captured your fatigue breast cancer survivors, um, but what we noticed was that their VEGF levels and certain inflammatory markers were really spread out. So there was really a diversity of, of values there, which made the data harder to analyze. In our case, we had fatigued women that were anywhere from six months to 10 years post-treatment, but had debilitating amounts of fatigue. That's what tied them together. So, you know, anyway, I'd be curious to know in the blood markers what you're thinking of looking at. Well, I, I think that um, actually, uh, Shamini, you've, you've taken us down one of the paths that we would like to pursue uh, in future meetings um, and, and have a more detailed and nuanced uh, discussion of, of, of research, um, as well as uh, the, the humanistic and, and practice-oriented theoretical underpinnings and practical underpinnings of, of uh, trying to figure out exactly what's going on. Uh, so I think uh, since just to keep us on schedule, uh, as we're waiting, we're slowly waiting for people to join us, um, uh, I think maybe we should uh, just take a minute, take a few minutes to uh, take a minute or two just to settle into where we are. <clears throat> take three deep and relaxing breaths into our body and mind together and clear away the previous 
thoughts and uh, images and feelings from the previous day. And get ready to receive uh, the lecture uh, by Dr. Fruhoff. Should I start screen sharing then, or? Uh, just uh, give me a minute. I'm gonna. We're gonna do some introductions. Uh, oh, right. okay, okay. So, um, my name's Hal Roth. I direct the Contemplative Studies Initiative and Concentration, uh, the first undergraduate uh, major in uh, North America in this area of contemplative studies. And contemplative studies, of course, embraces the research that's being done on uh, vital energy. And this research, we feel, has a very important contemplative dimension to it. So I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the what we're calling the Kerr Vital Energy Research Collaborative. Um, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Contemplative Studies and of the Kearney Institute for uh, Brain Sciences at Brown University. This is the beginning, we hope, of, of um, a long and beneficial collaboration to try to explore from, as we do in Contemplative Studies, uh, humanistic, scientific, artistic, and first person direct uh, first person engagement and approaches and practical approaches, the various phenomena that are central to the transformation of consciousness and the integration of mind and body. So I'd like to welcome you uh, to the first in uh, a series of lectures and seminars that we are planning to run this year and into next year. And I would like to say a few words about the person after whom our series is named, uh, Dr. Catherine Kerr. Kathy was a really tireless researcher, a dedicated researcher who really helped advance the field of embodied contemplative neuroscience through her innovative mind and body lab here at Brown and to advance the field of contemplative studies through her research, her mentoring, and her teaching of students in her concentration and in the Warren Alpert School of Medicine. She was a true contemplative scientist who embodied the work she studied. She was a true creative spirit who not only thought outside the box, she lived outside the box. After receiving her PhD in history at Johns Hopkins and encountering a serious health crisis, um, that she treated uh, eventually through a combination of Chinese and Western medical practices. Kathy won a prestigious five-year NIH K award and completely retrained in neuroscience under the tutelage of the, Chris is a bit modest about this, of, of Dr. Chris Moore at MIT. And of course, Chris has now uh, uh, joined us here at Brown. Um, uh, Kathy, uh, came to the Department of Family Medicine at Brown in 2011 and to the Contemplative Studies Initiative and she was named Director of Translational Neuroscience with us. At Brown, she created this wonderful uh, lab of, uh, she called the Embodied Neuroscience Lab whose main research programs were the Resilience Project in the Alpert School of Medicine now uh, continued by Dr. Ellen Flynn and Chloe Zimmerman, and the Vitality Project, a clinical trial we just started talking about that she designed to investigate the role of Qigong in cancer survivors that has been led by Dr. Stephanie Jones and Chloe since Kathy's uh, unfortunate passing four years ago, or maybe four years ago tomorrow, um, or pretty close to four years ago tomorrow. Um, uh, in 2015, after delivering a widely viewed TEDx talk, she traveled to India to present 
her pioneering work on the neuroscience of mindfulness to His Holiness the Dalai Lama at the Sarah Monastery, where she was called upon to provide basic neuroscience teaching to young monks. A talented researcher, teacher of contemplative practices and mentor of young students, she was instrumental in shaping this emerging field. We are continuing Kathy's inspirational work through this lecture and seminar series and through a number of research projects uh, in the coming years. So I'd like to now uh, introduce to you Dr. Stephanie Jones, who will say a few more uh, I, uh, words about uh, the research and about our uh, seminar and lecture series. Steph? Okay, thank you, How uh, So hello, everyone. I am Stephanie Jones, and I'm an associate professor in the neuroscience department here at Brown University and one of the co-organizers of this series that we'll be having. So I first wanna also thank you all for joining us. It's, it's really just extremely exciting to see the number of people that are here today. And some of Kathy's former students are here, her family members are here um, and lots of friends and colleagues. So, so it's just a really um, a thrilling thing for all of us who have been organizing the workshop. And so I had the great fortune to be a, a friend and colleague of Kathy's for many years. And so I just wanted to spend a few minutes honoring Kathy by highlighting her transformative scientific contributions and her visions on the role of vital energy in health and healing and how that laid the path to the workshop series that we're starting today. So Kathy was a true visionary. Um, as Hal described, she was trained as a historian, but through personal experience developed this passion for studying the health benefits of mind and body meditative practices. And she went on for a rigorous training in neuroscience with uh, Dr. Christopher Moore. And she also worked with Dr. Ked Kapchuk at Harvard's Osher Center for Integrative Medicine. And so she has a really rich and broad background. I met Kathy when she started working with Chris. Um, at that time, we were all working at Mass General Hospital. And Chris and Kathy and I collaborated for several years. And our main focus area of research was investigating brain dynamics associated with somatosensory perception and attention. And we found some clear evidence that mindfulness practices, um, in particular MBSR, change the brain response to shifts in somatic attention. And we had several papers on this um, and they're among our most well-cited publications, which really speaks to the importance of this research in the field. And then through different paths, Chris, Kathy, and I all moved our labs to Brown. It was really kind of serendipitous, um, and we were fortunate to continue working together for many more years. And so, as many of you know, early in her career, Kathy became ill with multiple myeloma cancer and had a very dire prognosis. She learned about the potential health benefits of the Chinese medical practice of Qigong, and she went to China and attended what she referred to as Qigong camp. And after camp, she integrated a dedicated Qigong practice into her life. And she believed that this practice led to physical healing in her body. And she lived for over 20 years with this aggressive form of cancer. And so this personal experience created this strong passion in Kathy to study the physiological underpinnings of Qigong and the relationship to the immune system that could lead to healing. But at that time, there was no real funding mechanism for this research. So then about six years ago, in the fall of 2014, Kathy had the very good fortune of being introduced to Mara Berkman Landis, who is here with us in our meeting today, and who shared Kathy's vision to enhance scientific understanding of how energy practices can lead to, can lead to improve health. Um, and they also shared the desire to create programs and curriculum to establish best practices in the teaching of these techniques and bringing them to the clinic. And so in collaboration with Mara and through a very generous donation from the Berkman Landis family, Kathy began this clinical trial, which she referred to as the Vitality, Vitality Project to investigate the impact of Qigong on measures of vitality in cancer survivors. And the primary outcome measure was improvements in fatigue, which Kathleen knew personally was perhaps the most debilitating outcome of cancer survivors. She collected a battery of multimodal data to examine the potential physiological underpinnings, underpinning of enhanced vitality in Qigong, and we're still analyzing that data and we'll discuss it in a future lecture uh, during this series. 
So sadly, halfway through the clinical trial, Kathy's illness progressed. And it was clear that she wasn't going to be able to see the study to the end. And so toward the end of her life, Kathy asked if I would take over the research and the mentorship of her team and see the study through. So as you can imagine, this was a very humbling request um, and quite an honor that Kathy felt that she could trust that I could do this research. But it was also extremely overwhelming and intimidating as I knew I could never replace Kathy. Um, and I also knew very little about Qigong and energy practice. But I believe strongly in Kathy's vision and I agreed to take the stewardship of this project. And so we met several times before she passed um, and I asked her outright, you know, what should I focus on to continue the work that you want to do? And Kathy's response, and I'm quoting Kathy here, she said, the body has its own intelligence and the brain's awareness of the body can elicit healing. During embodiment practices, subtle information gets sent to the muscles and this should be reflected in a sensitivity that goes to the brain. And so it's a conversation between the brain and the body and not a one-way direction that leads to healing. If you use this principle to guide you, you will be following what I wanna move forward. And so I accepted Kathy's request um, and I've been trying my best to follow her wise guidance. And I felt extremely fortunate to have done so, um, not only because I've personally witnessed the power of Qigong and healing in my life, but also because I inherited Kathy's team of brilliant and hardworking students. And it's without these students that the research could not have moved forward. And, and there's one student in particular that I want to point out, and that's Chloe Zimmerman, um, who many of you know, and is one of the organizers of this workshop and here with us today. So Chloe was an undergraduate contemplative studies student when she started working with Kathy. And she has shown this unwavering dedication to the project and really has taught me the ins and outs of the study. Um, her level of expertise and commitment was well beyond that of a typical undergraduate. She also helped create the curriculum for teaching mindfulness to medical students that was launched as the Resilience Project that Hal mentioned. And this was a collaboration between Kathy and Dr. Ellen Flynn at Brown Medical School. And Ellen's here with us today as well. Um, and Dr. Flynn continues to carry on the research and teaching of mindfulness to the Brown medical students. So Chloe's now an MD PhD student in my group at Brown um, and she and I and several researchers are in the process of continuing to analyze this big data set. And as I mentioned, we'll discuss it at a later workshop. So another vision that Kathy and Mara shared was that the way to transform Qigong energy practice into a respected and clinically impactful field of study was to begin a dialogue between Qigong masters, scholars in the history of Qigong as an established Chinese medical practice and scientists who can bring rigor to the study of the physiological and behavioral outcomes of the practice. And so they had this idea to have a multi-day workshop to bring together participants from each of these fields who would be willing and dedicated to create a framework for transforming energy practice into an established field of study. And so that is the goal of this workshop series. And it's been planning, it's been in the planning stages for years. Um, and we had hoped to have it in person at Brown, but given the pandemic, we've decided to move it online. This may be fortuitous because now we're able to have attendees from all over the world. And again, it's really thrilling to see everyone here today and to have come to this point, which we've been working towards for years um, and to know that you're all interested in learning from each other about how we can move forward a framework to understand the role of vital energy in health and healing. And so with that, I thank you again. It's, it's wonderful to see you all and I'll pass it over to Hal who can introduce our inaugural speaker. Uh, thank you, Steph. Um, and I, I want to echo Steph's uh, words of welcome. It's wonderful to see all of you here and look forward to seeing you uh, uh, for our future meetings as well. Our inaugural speaker in this series is Dr. Heiner Fruhoff. He was born into a German family of medical doctors specializing in natural healing modalities. He studied Sinology, Philosophy, and Comparative Literature at Tübingen University, at Fudan University in Shanghai, at University of Hamburg, at Waseda University in Tokyo, and 
at the University of Chicago, where he earned a, a PhD from the Department of East Asian Languages and Civilizations in 1990. In a, a parallel manner to the way in which uh, Kathy uh, uh, got uh, really focused on Chinese uh, medicine, uh, Heiner also encountered a very serious health crisis um, uh, in his life. Um, and he became interested in supplementing the theoretical training he was getting in the philosophy and cosmology of Chinese medicine with the study of clinical applications. And so uh, after he finished his PhD, he went for postdoctoral training at Chengdu University of Traditional Medicine in Sichuan province, where he worked on formula studies and the classical foundations of Chinese medicine. He sought out the classical roots of Chinese medicine outside the institutionalized traditional Chinese medicine setting. He also studied Taoist medicine and Jinjing Qigong. He studied Shang Han Lun pulse diagnosis. He studied Taoism, the Taoist religion in Sichuan and traditional folk art and music in Sichuan province. Since 1992, he's published widely on both the theoretical and clinical aspects of Chinese medicine. He presently serves as founding professor of the College of Classical Chinese Medicine at the National University of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon, where until recently he served as Dean and he's been teaching there since 1992. His scholarly endeavors include the direction of an ongoing research project on the archaic symbolism of Chinese medicine terminology. As a practitioner in private practice, he focuses on the complementary treatment of difficult and recalcitrant diseases, including cancer, heart disease, and chronic digestive disorders. I can think of no better person to present the inaugural lecture in our series in honor of our dear friend and colleague, Kathy Kerr, than Dr. Heiner Fruhoff. Dr. Fruhoff. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, uh, Hal. I am absolutely honored to be here with this illustrious group of people. Um, I will be talking about the, uh, through the lens of a Chinese medicine practitioner about the history of qi. Uh, coming at it from both a medical perspective, uh, but also a cultural history perspective. I am hoping that this will work with the screen share here. Should, can you see this? Yes. Thanks, Heiner. All right. Okay, here is, What do I do if I click, how do I, this is a PDF and uh, somehow it, now that it's in Zoom, I don't get it to move to the next slide. Anybody have a? So there's an arrow at the top of the um, PDF that maybe if you click on that arrow, it'll push through. Yeah, okay, I hope that, thank you. Yeah, so <clears throat> I uh, have of course uh, prepared too many slides here and we don't have to go through all of them. I just wanted to be as complete as I, I can and we can just uh, see how far we get with that. So the there are of course many, many different aspects of qi that start with the ontological, philosophical, and then in the physical body of the human being, the microcosm of the human being, from the, phys the physiological to the pathological, to the psychological, to the emotional. And one big thing that we always find from the very beginning, from the fourth century onward, all the way until right now, is this dualism of materialism and idealism or the, the spiritual 
way of looking at the character Qi. Um, I, um, as a synologue, I always like to go back to the beginning and look at the original characters. So the earliest uh, script version is uh, the Oracle Bones and, uh, you know, from like 1500 BC or so. And it is just waves, you know, the character Chi is originally waves that then in certain variations uh, gets clarified as sort of solar like waves. So associated with heaven, associated with the sun. And uh, later commentators then say these characters are what uh, is basically chi in this form here. Um, these, these early characters that just look like waves, particularly the left character is probably the earliest other than what I just showed you version of chi. Uh, and then better known what we see here on the right, very important to note this three form, you know that you have a line at the top, a line in the middle, and then line at the bottom and then sort of penetration into the above and the below. That is the meaning of chi, some kind of like a gas, like an energy reaching and connecting everything. At the very beginning, uh, the phenomenon of chi was related to the sky, to heaven. Uh, like here's a quote from the Huang Di Neijing, uh, the in the heaven, uh, what is chi in the heaven? Then, in on earth, material form gets completed, and those two together create the material world. Um, so, chi is first in the most ancient, from the very character to the ancient text, something that streams down from the heavens. We have the character for heaven here on the left one uh, odd variation of the character, but that demonstrates that phenomenon, almost like the character for Qi itself on the right, this kind of heaven is this emanation of Qi that is inundating our reality and is primordial and uh, earlier than physical form. Um, so then, at the, these are related then in, in later forms of writing uh, is sort of an etymological word field for the character Qi. Of course, the number three here on the upper left, because we have these three lines that we saw there at the very beginning. And number three, very important, right? That famous sentence in the Tao Te Ching, the Tao gives birth to the one, the one to the two, to two to the three, and then the three produces the 10,000 things. We could also say that it's the qi, the interaction of yin yang coming out of the two that produces everything else. Interesting here on the right-hand side, you see the character Wang for king, which is basically a three with a line through. So the king is, he or she who connects uh, all three realms together. And then also the character Jade, which in ancient times, Jade was something that symbolizes the purity of the heart, but was used in shamanic rituals to also connect the three realms. I particularly find that the, uh, the earliest form of Qi really is this here, what is now written Qian, which is exclusively almost the name of hexagram one in the classic of change. Uh, here we can see, you know, that we have this component Qi here, but we also have this trigram Qian is these three lines again, which uh, means, you know, like the, the hexagram one out of which all of the other the uh, hexagrams in the Yijing, the Book of Change, are created, which is the earliest utterance of Chinese literary culture, other than the oracle bones themselves. Um, the, 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 the hex, all the other hexagrams come out of this hexagram one, which is pure yang qi, pure heavenly qi, pure solar qi. So therefore, no surprise also that one of the early variations um, this is according to 
my friend uh, Manfred Kubny, who wrote a dissertation about Xi in German uh, 25 years ago, uh, another character for Xi on the right, which is basically emanations of the sun. Uh, with a quote on the left of the Yellow Emperor's classic of medicine, uh, you know, that the, the, the Yang Qi, the solar Qi, is suffusing everything under heaven. So at the very beginning, therefore, Qi, ontological, philosophical, uh, it's almost like Qi is equal to the Tao. Qi is weather in the heavens, it's like cloud, it's like a gas. Uh, that kind of meaning. And the ontology in the I Ching, if we kind of study the I Ching and then put it together to the uh, people sort of in the Zhou dynasty, Warring States period, early Han dynasty, that was sort of the structure of reality coming out of the I Ching. We've got the immaterial Tao that then takes on motion uh, formative, you know, it's the, the motion of the Tao is Qi, and then Xiang is imagery, uh, like there is almost like we have the thoughts of the universe of the Tao, then there is this uh, almost electromagnetic uh, momentum that wants to express itself in material form, then starts forming images and forming shapes, Xing, and forming Qi, here, another kind of chi, which means the three-dimensional world in essence. So basically, sort of the heavenly immaterial world on the left, and then the earthly matter-shaped world on the right. And uh, it's only sort of since the fourth century BC that we find chi written how it is written now, uh, with the rice radical underneath, and the whole character chi actually originally meant rice and is defined like this in the uh, Han Dynasty Shouwenji, it's a dictionary. Um, uh, so qi is a type of stuff, you know, so now we looking at it as uh, not, not just matter, but it is a kind of material substance that is like rice, that is like the, the basic thing that nourishes everything else. So we have more material com components come into it. And therefore, no surprise that the early word for qigong, which is a more modern uh, word, is yangsheng, which means nourishing life. Basically, you're eating something, you're feeding your physical body. You qi is something that you almost eat like a food and thereby nourish life. Um, in the uh, early period uh, from like 500 BC onward, uh, Qi was primarily described as a unity phenomenon. Everything is one Qi in this universe. And of course, Zhuangzi, uh, and we have the world expert on Zhuangzi, not just the Huainanzi sitting right here with Hal. Um, lots of references on, you know, at the very big primordial beginning of time, uh, there was nothingness and this nothingness had no name. And from here on rose the, the unity chi of the world and this oneness had no physical form. Um, and we find this concept, this kind of energy vortex as oneness in, the for, in other cultures as well, particularly in Egypt and Sumer, the Greeks had it in, in the form in, in the Middle Ages, I think called the Ouroboros, uh, shaped like the snake or dragon that bites itself into the tail. Uh, that is this one she of nature that goes round the wheel of the year and is creating everything. In the symbol science of Chinese culture, then this one she gets sliced down more and more into, uh, as we know, yin and yang. Uh, when the qi is rising, for instance, the spring and summer, that is yang qi. When it, when it contracts in the fall and winter, that's yin qi, uh, but basically still the same qi, just different names, different 
angles of uh, contemplation here. Uh, we have, you know, the two gets divided into four. So the year in spring that she is uh, giving birth to everything in the summer that as the expansion of the chi grows, the material world grows with it. And in the fall, the chi is, the universal chi is contracting. Uh, and uh, with it, the fruit of the agricultural world gets um, harvested. And then in winter, everything, the chi goes below the surface and the material world disappears once again. Out of these four phases come the five system that is so important for Chinese medicine, especially, uh, you know, wood element dominating uh, in springtime fire in the summer, uh, the metal mountains, rust colored leaves, uh, particularly now where on the East Coast, you see it even more than here on the West Coast and then the ice and snow of the water element in the winter. These are material things symbolizing the energy of the four season with this uh, transformative season in the middle between each season uh, called the earth uh, element. Um, the Chinese, particularly even preceding, I think the five element system, there is this observation that there are these 12 lunar mansions and uh, there are these the course of the sun and the moon through these 12 stations we have that also of course in Egypt and India and uh, elsewhere in ancient traditions and the Chinese used the you know the 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 uh, so-called 12 title hexagrams to describe the advance of the yang qi on the left first there is at the bottom is one, one yang, then turns two yang, three yang, et cetera. So the yang is rising over here on the left and then yin is rising here on the right. Uh, but basically it's still the same one chi, but symbolically divided further. And in the realm of music, we have this, or cosmology, you could also say there is, it's. The, the, the chi is described every month has a particular vibration that are uh, described as the 12 pitch standards, which can be translated into Western terms and has been. Uh, so almost like the universe at every month is humming at a different vibration, at a different uh, pitch there. That's why they call it the 12 pitch pipe standards. There is a professor at Stanford University called Lothar von Falkenhausen, who's the, the expert on the pitch standards. And the 12 months in ancient Chinese cosmology are further divided into the 24 qi. Every two weeks, there's another qi uh, that kicks into gear. And, uh, you know, beginning of spring, rainwater, awakening of insects, etc. Um, we are, of course, here well into uh, the, the, we here almost at the beginning of winter, I would say. Uh, and furthermore, in Chinese symbol science, these qi get even this one qi that gets divided into two, into four, into five, into 12, into 24, gets further divided into 72 qi. Every five days, there's another qi uh, that are called the, the qi sha wuho, the 72 material manifestations. Here we have an example of the first months of spring um, where you have literal material stuff happening like the east wind melts the ice, first five days, the hibernating insects begin to stir, etc. Um, we have, during the Western Han, probably the second century BC, we have the attempt to merge all of these systems into one and have uh, yin yang, five elements, the so-called uh, liu qi, the six, uh, the three yin and the three yang division into six. Um, and uh, then also the 12 system, but then of course the I Ching has 64 hexagrams and you use 60 of those 
divide divide around the cycle of the year. They literally called the Gua Qi, the how each hexagram of the I Ching is describing a different weather pattern around the year. Uh, the classical, the medicine classic, the uh, Nei Jing is, uh, has important treatises in it that is, uh, has the science of Wu Yin Liu Qi that is based on everything prior, uh, that is basically describing in a 60 year cycle, there are different weather patterns and because of that, there are different diseases. And uh, that is very relevant uh, for the understanding of the coronavirus, for instance, because we're in the year Gengzi, I believe the 37th year of the cycle, and that's always co called the year of disaster. That's always 1960, 1900, uh, 1840, right? Opium War, 1840, 1900, Boxer Rebellion. Every time major disasters, major political unrest, violent suppression of that and uh, starvation uh, and epidemic disease following that. So from, a, from this perspective of this ancient science, not a surprise that this year is a mess. Um, the uh, famous uh, founder of the, uh, uh, the epidemic disease school in Chinese medicine, a subgroup of the so-called fever school, Ming Dynasty here, Wu Yuxing, he wrote a famous book in the treatment on epidemic pestilence. He says there are certain times in nature when there is a type of abnormal qi, a type of yi qi or li qi that periodically exists between heaven and earth. And it comes in the mouth and the nose and then nests deep inside of your body. He says like a hibernating animal and there it cannot be reached by regular herbal medicines. And then it, at a certain point, it explodes outward from there and invades the organs. Uh, that's kind of what we see here with COVID that you know, people get infected, nothing happens for a while. And all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose from within. And then regular medicine has no explanation for that. So there is like many, many books written about this in Chinese medicine, this uh, epidemic uh, theory. So the history of Chinese culture is overall speaking, what I call alchemy. It's this fusion coming back to this very second, the first or second slide where you've got the macrocosm above the material world below the microcosm of the earth and then in between the human being. Uh, and uh, that is the essence of qi because qi is what keeps everything together. In a particularly important passage of the Lingshu part of the Yellow Emperor's Classic of Medicine, uh, it, it, it says the so-called 12 organ networks of Chinese medicine, they are not, and I'm elaborating a little bit, the anatomical organs, but they are functional relay systems. They like vibrations that are very much like the vibrations that are present in form of the pitch standards during the months. They are like the powers that are there during the 12 months of the year. They are like the 12 stellar houses that reign over these 12 uh, months and et cetera, et cetera. So my, this ultimate statement to bring the microcosm of the body together with the micro, macrocosm of nature. So this has been my personal uh, research uh, hobby or passion. I very much enjoyed the quote earlier, you have to pick something and stick with it. And uh, I have stuck with this topic for about 20 years, maybe to the, the detriment of my students because they might <laughs> getting tired of hearing about more symbol stories. But this is so fascinating to me how ancient cultures, Chinese culture particularly, was linking uh, functions in nature directly uh, with a map of functions in the human body and describing that to the nth degree. In, in amazing detail, that's not just intellectually stimulating, 
in uh, uh, anthropologically interesting, but from a medical perspective, extremely illuminating, at least to a Chinese medicine practitioner, it helps us diagnose our patients. So the stomach, for instance, we're, we're reading in, in the body and its functions would go with these various, you know, you look at the, the, the stellar constellations. Interestingly, there's also a stomach constellation in the sky right here at this particular month of the year, the third lunar month, approximately April. Uh, and, you know, you look at the earthly stem and the hexagram 43 in this case, uh, the time of day that's parallel, it's third months is likened to the energy of the time period from 7 to 9 a.m. All of that can illuminate us about what is meant when ancient people said the stomach or stomach chi or stomach function. Um, that is called eugenology, that bringing medicine and eugen symbol science together or yi yi xue in Chinese. And again, that is a big field in China uh, that is not utilized much in the, in the West or in modern Chinese medicine though. So starting to look more at it from a medical perspective now. So we of course have the most important thing in this symbol science is the one she divided as yin and yang, the two phases of uh, emergence of the qi, the important thing to keep in mind, the classics always remind us that behind the two is always the one. And that the yin yang emerges from this one unified center. And no matter how complicated the world is, the Neijing says here, whether there is yin yang turning into 10 or 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 or a billion, the essence of it is always goes back to this one Xi that Chuang Tzu spoke about. And, uh, you know, then later physicists, of course, got interested in this cosmology because they used to say this is exactly how we in physics look at this. It's this big bang explosion out of this nothingness where there's no matter really to speak of. And then we have this expansive movement of the universe that at some point then starts contracting again. Um, very similar. And important though, and this is what the Chinese way of observing it is, is that yin yang emerges out of oneness, out of its prenatal state, a Chinese medicine practitioner would say, and we now in the postnatal reality where you have both energy and matter. And now that it is there, the world is polar, yin yang, and it wants to, yin yang wants to come together and is eternally seeking to return to its unified roots. Here a quote from the Taoist Taiping Jing. Uh, so like two poles, our world is yin yang is like two poles on a magnet and together they create energy. That's the two producing the three and that out of this interplay then comes the world of the 10,000 things. Um, but it also means yin yang are drawn to each other and want to become one. So very sexual imagery. Therefore also we find uh, yin yang portrayals here in the anthropomorphic portrayal of Fuxi and Nuba, for instance, during the Han Dynasty on the left or in uh, Buddhist uh, portrayals here on the right. We also have some Taoist temples with similar statues that are usually located at the center of the temple, center, and oneness always go together. Um, the Chinese culture therefore is, I don't want to say obsessed, but is centered around, <laughs> pivots around this idea of centrality. So much so that of course, China is called Zhongguo, the central country. Chinese medicine is Zhongyi, the medicine not only of China, but 
of, of the center or bring everything back to the center uh, because that's where the chi emerges and the classics starting with these ones. These are some Ma Wang Dui bamboo strips excavated from I think the third century BC or so. Um, they all contain this, you know, for instance, here is a very brief text where King Wen, the founder of the Zhou dynasty is on his deathbed and talking to his son, King Wu. And he says, there's only one thing I want to tell you, Bao Xun, piece of essential advice. And this term in this very short text, Qiu uh, Zhong, Shou Zhong, always seek the center, always hold on to the center, whatever that means uh, is, is mentioned several times and keeps appearing in other, hello? Did things freeze up? We're still yeah, it, can you I, I can you still see me and hear me because it's yes. I'm I can't nothing is moving I can only uh, <laughs> I can I can only hear you but uh, can you still hear me but yes yes okay. yep. we can hear you and we see the Tsinghua uh, bamboo strips slide yeah my problem is now that all of a sudden this is frozen and not moving forward and. That is unfortunate. Um, anybody have some troubleshooting advice why this would? So can you close out the PDF and reopen it maybe? Oh, okay. there it goes. Oh, there. It's moving again. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, perfect. So then, uh, thank you very much. It's just started to come back all on its own here. Um, so we have Tao Te Ching, for instance, chapter five here, uh, you know, don't talk so much, it's just hold on to the center. That's the most important thing, is sort of an echo. So to the ancient Chinese, it, macrocosm first, microcosm second. After if the macrocosm was the center of the sky, which is the, re, not, just a big dipper, which was in the center of the sky, but the region next to it, where the actual center is located. And um, uh, the, the, the emperor of the sky, you know, that power emanating from there, you know, that very often the, 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 the equivalent of uh, God, Di, or Shangdi in ancient uh, China uh, was always portrayed uh, during the Han Dynasty as riding in the cart of the dipper because that force symbolized here uh, was emanating from the center of the sky. And you find that like on the right, you see some excavations very often referencing the dipper as something that is special. Uh, uh, we have uh, here, of course, the very voluminous work of uh, David Pankanier is talking about this character D for emperor and how he believes that this was an, the character for that was an actually an ancient measuring device uh, that would help you to find the center of the sky that Chinese people already in 1900 80 or so BC, uh, when they started getting dynastic ambitious, uh, ambitions, started aligning their houses toward and uh, toward the north and south axis uh, because the chi was emanating from there. Um, the center of the sky was empty for the ancient Chinese because we have the procession of the equinoxes, right? So we might have a pole star right there in the middle today, but back then it was a little off. And so you would have basically the real center where the <laughs> black hole is from which all radio waves that give life are emanating from, from a physicist perspective, 
astrophysicist perspective is empty. And so that's why there was this concept that the center is emanating energy chi, but it is materially empty. You can't see anything there. And you find therefore a whole philosophy of emptiness around that, like in this quote, for instance, in the Tao Te Ching, that there are 30 spokes come together to form a hub in the wheel, but it is the emptiness of the central space that makes it uh, useful. Um, so we have this concept, cosmological ontological concept that there is chi formative power spiraling out in a vortex form and creating life and matter around it. And uh, therefore lots of things, whether it is a storm here or whether it is a, uh, okay, uh, other kinds of life forms, uh, we find this spiraling form. And the, uh, one of the ancient worms, words to describe this is the character jiu. Uh, jiu is often translated as decision-making or dredging something, but the original meaning uh, is uh, spiraling from a central vortex. And in the Ling Shu uh, part of the medical classic, there is a chapter called jiu qi, the spiraling qi. And it starts out with the yellow emperor asking, there are all these qi in the human body. There's jing qi, essence qi, there's fluid qi, there's blood qi, there's vessel qi. But uh, in the end, they all won. Why do they have so many different names? So the whole chapter is kind of about that. Um, so if we now go into the Chinese medicine microcosm and go like, we know where the center of the sky is, where is that center in the human being where all healing power comes from? Uh, there are various candidates there. From a modern perspective, uh, there is typically this going to the so-called middle burner and the spleen and then working with the spleen chi and the stomach, which is all about material uh, metabolism of food and drink and maybe oxygen, digestive system, uh, et cetera. So it's called the middle central burner, right? In Chinese medicine, zhongjiao. But uh, really more important is this, this the prenatal aspects. Uh, uh, they are deeper in the body than that. And they are located on this axis, I believe. Uh, we have on the, here the, mapping of the 12 tidal hexagrams and the 12 months of the year on the outer wheel. And we have the 12 organ networks of the body on the inner wheel. We can see that these hexagrams, they make, uh, they all arranged uh, around the central axis that the Chinese call Tianmen Dihu, the heavenly, uh, gate and the earthly door. And uh, that connects two different regions of the sky, um, uh, hexagram one and hexagram two here, but that would be the axis of the spleen and the triple warmer. So the more postnatal center of the body is definitely the spleen and the stomach, but the more primordial and so-called prenatal uh, center would be the mysterious triple warmer organ that doesn't even have an, uh, or I would say from a Chinese medicine perspective, appropriately does not have an anatomical organ associated with it because it's the emptiness uh, at the center, there's emptiness, there's nothing and everything else comes from that. The triple warmer uh, is associated with hexagram uh, two uh, on this uh, hollow map. And in the Ma Wang Dui Jing, that name was actually not Kun Earth, but was Chuan, which means flow. And we can see there is the number three again, or the ch character Qi again, but turned on its side, which is by no means coincidental, I think. 
So uh, the stellar constellations at the beginning of winter, approximately Scorp um, Sagittarius, they are located literally in the heavenly stream in the Milky Way um, and near the galactic center from the perspective of astrophysics where most energy spews into our known universe and uh, therefore not inappropriate to think that there is such a center, such a energy center in the body. Uh, we know now that there is a black hole at the center of our known universe uh, and or our galaxy at least. And uh, as of last year, we've been able to photograph a black hole. Here it is that a famous photograph. And that looks like how you would imagine a Mingmen, uh, the vital gate uh, in the lower Danqian, uh, that nourishes everything else in the body with its qi from a Chinese medicine perspective. And that uh, Mingmen is directly associated not so much with the kidney, but with the triple warmer. Like we have in this fourth bu bullet here, we have a direct attribution of the, uh, this basically the adrenal gland in this vital gate position with the triple, uh, with the triple warmer. Um, the, so the triple warmer and the gallbladder, we should say, uh, which is right next to it and paired with it in the, as a Shaoyang organ, uh, they are sort of like a spiraling energy vortex at the center of the microcosm of the human being. And um, here we have the description of the gallbladder, which is situated right in the position on this alchemical map, hollow map, connecting macrocosm, microcosm of the winter solstice. And uh, the stellar constellation that goes with it, one of 28, is called the void, the great void. So there it is again, the empty center of the universe. In Neijing chapter nine, there is this enigmatic quote, fan shi yi zhang jie qu jue yu dan ye. Uh, all of the other organ networks, they take their power from the spiraling vortex from the original chi that spirals out of the gallbladder. So uh, the gallbladder and the triple warmer together, therefore, they are sort of like the center of the universe where this chi comes from. Furthermore, the gallbladder in this very enigmatic chapter eight that's very important for us as Chinese medicine practitioners because it compares the organ functions directly to offices at the royal court. It says the gallbladder is the rectifier of the organ networks, or you could say the gallbladder is the central organ that rectifies everything to bring it back to center and spiraling Here's the character Jury again. This is translated as decision making comes from it. And indeed, the gallbladder has something to do with chutzwa, with courage, with decision making. But the uh, original primordial meaning of the sentence is that the gallbladder is like the center of the sky, and spiraling vortex energy emerges from here that nourishes the rest of the body. Here is a Chinese movie picture of this rectifying officer uh, that is a little bit like the, reminds me of the, uh, of course there would be a negative, but in ancient China, this was a positive, uh, none more important than that, but uh, of the, um, oh, during the Middle, e Middle Ages, the, the, uh, the, you know, the, the church officer that had the power to, 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 uh, to, to, to arrest people or so if they were doing something wrong. The image of the winter solstice is that, and that is images shared in the symbolism of the gallbladder, particularly in the acupuncture point names of the gallbladder, you see that is the emergence of light out of darkness. Uh, this here is a picture of 
the Stone Age site of Newgrange in Ireland were only during the three days of the winter solstice and the day before and the, after you have a shaft of light come through three ancient holes in the ceiling at the entrance that is hundreds of yards away that reaches all the way to the grave chamber. So this is sort of like ancient cosmology visualized that this is sort of like a picture of the Big Bang, life coming out of this spiraling vortex black hole of the universe uh, and is repeated every winter. And in the body, this is Mingman energy emerging uh, out of our triple warmer and gallbladder function. Um, this is Isadora Duncan. This is too long of a story. I'm going to skip that. <laughs> um, the gallbladder and the triple warmer together, they form something that is called uh, Xianghu, is ministerial fire. And the Neijing says, the classic of medicine says, imperial fire, which is the fire of our heart and our mind functions by illuminating above, whereas this ministerial fire of the triple warmer and the gallbladder functions by positioning below, meaning it's a more material fire. I can't cook a pot if the fire is above the pot, the fire needs to be below. So one important measure in Chinese medicine is to make gallbladder qi specifically, here we see it on the right, go down into the lower dantian, because otherwise the pot cannot be cooked and our mind cannot be bright above and our bodily functions cannot work there. So this is a goal of meditation and of qigong is to constantly bring through the function of these uh, two organs, particularly the gallbladder, make the qi go down into the dantian so that it can rise from there and nourish the rest of the body. Here's a map, a qi flow map of uh, Huang Yan Yu, uh, a famous doctor of the Qing dynasty, who was particularly known for his description of the qi qi, the qi dynamic, the up-down dynamic of organ systems in the human body. So we essentially talking about this, this, this energy rising from the lowest chakra here, governed by the, by the gallbladder and the triple warmer to the higher chakras governed by the heart. Um, this central line and then um, the, even the Western word meditation means focusing on the center. Now here we have uh, on the left is a picture of my Qigong Shifu Wang Xingyu. On the right, we have uh, the well-known Chinese medicine a physician, Liu Li Hong, who's written the book, Classical Chinese Medicine, uh, that came out last year. And that was a, a bestseller in China because it was reminding people of the importance of the center and of the roots of Chinese medicine, uh, particularly the energetic roots. So focusing on the center, that is also what the Western uh, word meditation means. And in, in Chinese, most Chinese, particularly Taoist meditation practices, it means uh, activating the so-called microcosmic orbit, which is the central line in the back, and then the central line in the front, and then running through breath, through visualization, through squeezing of the perineum, et cetera, running the energy around here, but at the same time activating this central channel that we just looked at earlier. And then of course, uh, we can meditate with other parts in nature with trees, with waterfalls, and then we can take that qi uh, as Zhang Daoling, one of the founders of Taoism in the second century, uh, or did, or third century, you know, create fu shui, uh, putting that natural qi back into the medium of water and then treating people with that was one of the early uh, treatment methods. Absorption of qi here, of trees. Um, those are all different ways of 
absorbing this chi. And of course, uh, we can work in order to, so we can focus directly on the center. We can uh, surrender into nature and become centered. We can uh, work with our emotions. That's the entire enterprise of Confucianism as understood by myself is kind of like that is is focusing on is focusing on rectifying through the gallbladder who is the rectifier bringing our emotions back to a more centralized state so we're not bent out of shape and here's a you know confucius famous book jung yung the doctrine of the mean where it says all of these emotions when they are in just latent state, that's called being centered. But once the emotions get triggered, but they remain in a place where they're not over the top, then that is called har harmony. Uh, and so this concept of zhong he is the center of the Confucian enterprise, which is working with bringing emotions once they trigger back to center rather than going out there and getting a heart attack uh, or, or murdering somebody. So another way of finding back to center. Those Confucian healing practices on a very clinical level still exist uh, to the present day, even in China. Like for instance, Wang Feng Yi's a Qing Dynasty uh, educator, uh, 19, late 19th, early 20th century, uh, created emotional healing techniques that are still being practiced, sort of, uh, and have found their way into the West even. Uh, Lori, who is, uh, Lori Regan, who is my colleague at NUNM, she uh, has been instrumental of bringing that kind of work to the West. Another way of getting centered for the ancient Chinese was to utilize music. Uh, again, in Confucianism, uh, very important to get centered, get harmonized, to rectify our qi through the power of music. Uh, there was a term in the Li Ji, the Book of Rites, uh, the Yu Qi, the qi of music. And here is a nice quote from the Garden of Stories, uh, ancient book, where it says, with regard to the effect of external influences, none of them is more profound than sound. It can change humanity more than anything else. And that is why the emperor and his ministers always made sure that the sound of bells was present in their uh, state rooms and that the senior ministers had listened to the sound of the qin, the ancient lute. And, and, and so these are actual instruments that were excavated here from the Hubei Museum that were sort of like Bach's organ to the ancient Chinese. You would, you get triggered emotionally, you, <laughs> you listen to these 12 sounds to get back into harmony. Um, there is a, a colleague of mine who is uh, in Germany called René van Osten, a brilliant person who uh, talks about the Yijing and the Qi uh, that each one of the hexagram carries, but he's also translating that into music. He's a musician and uh, the, you see a monochord here on the right that he created uh, where he can play um, the, the hexagrams of the Yijing translated into music, into sound on the monochord and then uh, using that in clinical practice to heal people, like first diagnose them, you are hexagram 57. And therefore I play, and literally people will burst into tears when, when, when you write on, 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 on target. Here's a vineyard I once visited in Tuscany 10 years ago where they grow uh, the Brun famous Brunello de Maltalcino uh, and play Mozart to it. And the uh, University of Padua has shown that in fields where the Mozart is being played to the vines, you have less parasites, you get twice as much yield. Uh, so even plants, uh, or especially plants, we should say, uh, uh, respond to qi, not just in the form of weather, but in electromagnetic influences, but music. 
Um, acupuncture, of course, is a main way of uh, bringing qi back to the center. Um, it's interesting that the term gen for needle or acupuncture is a composition of the word metal and uh, hexagram uh, 31, which means attraction, attraction of want, yin and yang, that want to come back to the center. So needling and acupuncture actually means it is a way to make you access your universal, your, your source again, come back to the center. And uh, Yang Zhenghai, a Taoist practitioner of medicine, uh, recently uh, has been teaching for the last five years uh, this uh, technique that he calls the inner Huang Di Nei Zhen, the inner needling of the Yellow Emperor, that Liu Li Hong, the aforementioned colleague, uh, put into uh, that we helped uh, translate here into English, just came out a couple of months ago. And this type of needling is particularly focusing on uh, not pain relief or so, but is wants to bring the energy back to the center. If it's too high, needle the foot to bring it back to the center. If there's a problem on the right, needle the left to bring it back to the center and so on. And both of these books are reminding us that the Huang Di Neijing itself could be translated as the central emperor's classic on how to animate the body's central healing powers. And the main sentence in there is Zhi Bing Qiu Ben, uh, when treating disease, seek the root, but what is the root that is that center? So always seek the center. That's what Chinese medicine is about. And, um, but that is, requires looking for the immaterial, looking for the subtle. And that is difficult for us modern people who are a little bit like King Midas in ancient Greek mythology that everything we touch turns to matter. And we always want to find physical things associated with that. And uh, okay. Uh, in the realm of herbs, we have, you know, herbs are trying to bring things back to the center, particularly aconite. Uh, here you can see even the aconite root on the right is very much like, uh, it looks like a male genitalia, but you also have this, uh, you know, fuzi, it's called, uh, attached to the left and the right with the wuto root in the middle, even the very root. You know, this is the number one remedy that activates Mingmen, Yang energy, uh, the fire of the vital gate. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that even in its very gestalt, it mirrors the center. Uh, this is Lu Chong Han, the fire, uh, the lineage holder of the fire spirit school professor at Chengdu University of Chinese Medicine. Uh, he's uh, Mr. Aconite. He says using Aconite is like, shooting a goal in soccer. You can dribble and you can do beautiful things, but unless you shoot a goal, it doesn't count. So the shooting of a goal in Chinese medicine is you need to activate the, and tonify eventually the fire of the vital gate. All of the qi moving and phlegm transforming that makes you temporarily feel better, but to activate the self-healing powers of the body is a much deeper and more central affair. Um, we, of course, have in the uh, West, um, uh, and, and please, how you have your plan there, you know, it's, I've already said we not getting to the end of this, all of these slides, so you stop me at any point when you would like to go into another uh, shift gears and, and have a discussion or something like this. Uh, we can really, uh, the, 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 the most important things have been said. There is just some, some interesting things how qi now plays out, the discussion about qi plays out in the modern world, particularly in the discussion of qigong and in bringing it over to the West, uh, this is sort of the, 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 the latter part of it, but, but please feel free to, to stop me at any, at, at any point. So we have, of course, 
the vital concept, similar concept in the rest here is Manfred Krubny's list of, of these different concepts. And, uh, you know, the, the, we have translation of Qi, the earliest ones that Manfred found was uh, Andreas Kleyer's translation of Qi into Spiritus Sanctus, the Holy Spirit, you know, and Unschuld, Paul Unschuld, uh, the Sinologist, Chinese medicine expert is defending that and says this makes sense. And so here are some Western translations of qi. They are more like what we would call in Chinese medicine shen or shen qi, the, the spirit qi, the more heavenly qi that we encountered in the oracle bones at the very beginning. And it is, is, is important because the more we come into modernity, the less this more spiritual aspects of the qi is being looked at. Here, by the way, is the earliest character of shen, uh, that I know of, uh, my colleague, um, uh, uh, this is a German colleague and friend uh, who is an I Ching expert. This is, I think, 5,000 years old uh, on a pottery chart. A person struck by lightning, the earliest character for Shen. You know, like it's this download of heavenly energy into the human being image. Um, we have, of course, the grafting then once. Uh, the Jesuits brought Chinese cosmology philosophy and also Chinese medicine into the West. It was grafted on different, seen through different lenses, depending on where we were in our own science at the time. Um, the, uh, we then have very much influenced by energy science coming out of India and out of China, we have particularly in the early 20th century, we have all kinds of, you know, different, uh, you know, astral light and Blavatsky and 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 particularly Steiner, uh, who calls talks about etheric formative forces, etc. Um, and also, of course, unrelated to uh, Chinese concepts, we have homeopathy. Samuel Hahnemann talking about the dynamic force in the world. Etc. So, uh, Carl Gustav Jung also in the development of his psychology, uh, somewhat influenced by this entire these waves after wave of bringing uh, both Gnostic Western concepts of uh, spiritus and then Qi concepts into the West. He wrote in 1928 the article on psychic energy, so talking about psychological qi, mind qi. And then of course, modern physics, Friedrich Capra here, the Tao of physics in the, you know, starting in the 60s, 70s. Uh, and uh, we all remember the movie, What the Bleep Do We Know? It's sort of the, 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 the hippie wave and then that Japanese crystal, uh, water crystal expert where, Qi waves or thought patterns are manifested in 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 uh, in, in in water crystals, and then last but not least, Manfred Porker, professor at the University of Music, uh, Munich, Chinese medicine expert, then having a very systematic translation of different kinds of qi in the human body. Uh, into Western languages based on these Western pre-existing types of models. We then have, a, in the 20th century, a cross-cultural vitalism discussion where they influence each other back and forth. Uh, we have, you know, then the concept of qi being used for political purposes is, is again relevant today. Uh, including in the coronavirus treatment where they, you know, very patriotic to say, we are using Chinese medicine in China and that's why we dealing with this epidemic so much better. Um, there, it, it's, you know, there, here is an example, Tan Tung, the uh, tragically, of course, uh, executed uh, revolutionary, one of the reformers at the end of the Qing dynasty, 
who said, you know, they're digging into this ancient idea of qi versus Western scientific materialist influences. Qi is the greatest of all elements, but we cannot see it, we cannot hear it, but that's at the heart of our culture. Uh, this is, of course, then this tendency uh, of seeking roots of China and this Qi philosophy was strongly attacked, particularly by scientific materialism and Mao Zedong and his professors uh, who try to develop a model of Qi and interpret that through the lens of materialism and say, already during the Song Dynasty, people said Qi was a material thing. And that's why we think this is scientific and why we able and willing to investigate it because it's not a woo-woo phenomenon. And counterparts during the Republican era, of course, was, you know, uh, these kind of voices where it said science cannot solve all of our problems. Uh, we should better look toward the ancient philosophy of China and how they looked at Xi to look at our vision of reality is more our identity. And uh, in the very scientized 20th century, you had many different waves of people imploring, uh, academics imploring um, the government, first the Republican government and the communist government and say, we're losing the essence of our country by westernizing and scientificizing completely, we're losing as in the Wu Lao Shang Shu phenomenon 1962, we teach Chinese medicine, yes, but it's completely through the lens of Western medicine, uh, which is structural material rather than of this immaterial, uh, more physical uh, electromagnetic nature. And, uh, you know, so you have, including the, the, the foundation of our school and other schools since the last 25 years in the, in the Western world, we have 65 or so colleges of Chinese medicine in this country, but uh, only four or five are specifically dedicated toward this, let's look at the roots of our medicine, the, uh, rather than uh, following the scientist uh, materialist dogma that we have uh, in, in uh, this Mao Zedong originally mandated way of importing especially Chinese medicine and Qigong. So there was a, after the Cultural Revolution, there was a big wave of going into Qigong because they had invented in China uh, physical instruments that could measure electromagnetic flow and infrared light and warmth phenomena in Qigong and therefore they said, okay, it's not a woo-woo thing anymore. It's a scientific phenomenon. So there was all of a sudden this flood and Qigong was called, they call it Qigong Re. It was really hot, but then completely disappeared in 2000, of course, when there Falun Gong incident. And since that time you go, I, I've been bringing groups of people to China since 1994 and we always do Qigong, but since the year 2000, it's more problematic because you, 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 it's technically illegal to practice Qigong in a group of more than four people uh, on the street because people then say, oh, you're doing Falun Gong and the police immediately shows up, particularly if it's a group of Westerners. Not everywhere, it depends where you are, but uh, it's happened a lot to me and my groups. Um, so you have lots of these kind of treatises here. You know, the, 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 we not only regard, you know, this is the kind of language that the science around Qi, Qigong utilized to justify the exploration of Qigong uh, because they said it's a material thing and we can finally measure it. You know, we not only regard Qi as the original substance of the universe, but even consider the mind as an entity that's composed of chi from the perspective of Marxist philosophy, 
that of course in the mainland China, you always need to refer back to. This means that matter is the main characteristic of objective reality and as such the essence and foundation of our world. This is of course completely different as we've seen already uh, how qi was presented in ancient Chinese sources. So here we have more, you know, qi is, uh, qi is, uh, elect qi is electricity, qi is matter, qi is magnetism, but the important thing, it is something that we can measure, uh, including the qi emissions, white qi, external qi emissions of the qigong master, and therefore it was temporarily allowed to look at that. Um, here's a typical story of Qigong in China uh, of my teacher Wang Qingyu, who was born in 1937, uh, trained with uh, a Taoist abbot, and among other things, the, uh, uh, the, the, the bodyguard of Sun Yat-sen uh, here on the left side. This is him as a little boy, Wang Qingyu, with his father. And then uh, these, the, this picture that survived the Cultural Revolution has all of the most famous Kung Fu masters of the 1940s all in one picture. Uh, I can't name them all, but uh, he uh, studied as a little boy with uh, Huan Xi Daoren, the, the Taoist master with the ubiquitous smile. And but then his father died at age 12, shortly after he was a Kuomintang officer. And uh, so he was orphaned really quickly and sent as a young man, here he is in 1960, to basically the Gulag in, 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 in uh, uh, Eastern uh, Tibet, Western China, now Sichuan province, to teach school children. Uh, and there were all of these prison camps with Tibetan prisoners around that and very dangerous for him, for Chinese people to live there. So communist China put all of their uh, landowner uh, riffraff there, so to speak, uh, because if one of them dies, it doesn't really matter. Uh, here he is just a few years later, cultural revolution with his wife, uh, completely emaciated, half of his teeth are lost because he's, he's not allowed to practice Qigong. There was nothing uh, to eat, so no prenatal, no postnatal Qigong. He uh, only goes up into the mountains to practice his Qigong where nobody can see him because it's a, regarded a feudalist superstitious practice. Um, until in the early 1980s, he gets discovered by this man who was in charge to discover uh, Fame, you know, hidden folk healers from all around China to heal their leaders uh, uh, in Beijing and Olympic athletes. And he became installed as a professor at the Sichuan Academy of Cultural History and then started treating celebrities. Here is a Sichuan, a famous Taiwanese uh, uh, literary figure who he's treating with external qi. So he became all of a sudden from rags to riches, extremely famous. I, I, he wrote a book, I found him. Uh, he started teaching our students and still is for the last uh, 25 years. He is able to return to the Taoist temple where he's learned his qigong and uh, is coming to the West and is one of the main advisors at our college. So that is a typical sort of story of Qigong in modern China uh, where it was, you know, very valuable. That was completely forbidden. And then it was okay, as long as you look at it from a materialist perspective. And uh, that is kind of how it still is in a certain way. Um, the, ramifications now, and this is the last thing I want to say really, what does this mean, uh, the concept of qi and the discussion around that for modern life? You know, lots of things that go beyond uh, medicine, including the ugliness of modern life very often when we look at our cities. Here is a beautiful quote from chapter 19 of the Zhuangzi, where it is, 
you know, this famous craftsman is asked, why are your things, when I look at them, they touch me and move me, what are you doing? And he says, the one thing I do is I pay attention. Uh, I, I, I fast, I go into nature, I absorb nature. And when there's no thought of my own, I start these, the image of the instrument I'm trying to create emerges. And then I start out of complete emptiness, uh, craft this instrument, you know, and that's very often what we, you know, basically the process that is described as virtue, the of the the of the Tao Te Ching, it is really a type of physical energy or sensation, because here you can see how the character the for virtue in ancient times was identical to this character on the right, Ting, to listen. Uh, it's this listening to the subtle vibrations of the universe and then acting from that place. That is one written into the character. And whether you're a craftsman or a Qigong practitioner or a doctor or just an average human being, this is sort of what the ancient Chinese uh, person was aspiring to. You know? And then when you look at these beautiful sacred vessels here from the Shang Dynasty, uh, you, 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 they are emanations of that kind of a virtuous craftsmanship. Uh, I studied among other things, you know, my qi, uh, or the little bit I know about qi, I should say, is not just with Chinese medicine people and qigong people, but with this man, Wang Hua De, who is a musician and a collector of antiques. And he said, throw out all of your modern stuff because the people who created that, modern paintings, for instance, they think about how much money can I get for that? And that energy is in that painting. Whereas ancient painters, they were in that space that Zhuangzi just described. And that then, when you have paintings like this, they radiate that kind of energy into your house. So that is a profound thing. Then of course, in agriculture, we have completely industrialized agriculture that is based on biochemistry rather than on energetic transformations. And, uh, you know, from Rudolf Steiner to particularly this man, Kervran, and then in the end, Fritz Albert Pop, we know that food is so much more than just a bunch of biochemicals, but it is light. Uh, Fritz Albert Pop is the founder of a science that's called biophoton therapy. And he's written this book, The Botschaft der Nahrung, The Message of Food, where he took, where he created at the University of Marburg a measuring device that could measure the uh, amounts of light in any cell, including in the food. And he found if you have two apples, one of them's a wild crafted apple or by dynamically grown apple. And you have a supermarket apple that is, you know, sprayed with Roundup and whatnot. You, you, uh, and fertilized with, with the regular fertilizers. Biochemically, they're virtually identical, but the, the photons, the content of light in the wild crafted apple is 500 to 1000 times as high as in the supermarket one. And I think this is one, this is extremely important because why are so many people walking around with these heavy bodies and having no light in their eyes is because there is no light in the food anymore. We just look at the matter uh, aspect of nutritional science, not at the energetic aspect of it. Heiner, can I, I'm sorry to uh, inter interrupt you, uh, but we're, we're ga I'm gathering uh, questions in the chat, and I, um, we're officially going um, until 7.30. I mean, we could go a little bit longer, but I don't want to hold people longer than that. I mean, this is absolutely wonderful and rich, and um, I want to thank you so much for this uh, foundational lecture on uh, qi, uh, its origins, uh, and how it's... Um, uh, very much uh, a kind of important functional presence that we need to better understand. Um, so uh, 
I'd like to officially thank you and, and do the, the, the virtual version of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, then um, move to a number of questions, um, if we can. Uh, uh, I've probably got a dozen of them or so, and I'll see if I can um, group them. So um, let's see. Uh, the, there are a couple of questions concerning the gallbladder, which you emphasized a lot in its association with the triple heater and the uh, empty center and so on. Um, uh, one question is, um, what are the effects of uh, removal of gallbladder, which is a very uh, uh, popular surgery in the US on the alchemical descent of qi to the dantian? And the other question uh, about the gallbladder is, how does it help in decision-making or how do we understand its help in decision-making as you uh, talked about it from a Western uh, scientific uh, point of view, if that can be done. So first, the, the effect of the removal of gallbladder. Yeah, those are very pertinent questions indeed. The, the um, as I mentioned, the anatomical organs uh, that we know from the perspective of Western medicine, they're different from the 12 organ networks of Chinese medicine, but of course, the anatomical organ gallbladder belongs to the system that we call the gallbladder in Chinese medicine. We cannot operate the gallbladder of Chinese medicine out. That is like our universe has no big bang and there is not, you know, like there, the, the means like life would never have happened. And so that, that would, that, that it's, it's, it, you know, the anatomical gallbladder is like 2% of what the Chinese call the gallbladder, there are parts of our brain chemistry, of ad adrenaline, uh, hormones, uh, nervous system, et cetera, they all go under this uh, rubric of gallbladder. However, if you have problems in the physical gallbladder, for sure, you know that that is an indication, a symbol, an indicator that the energetic gallbladder system uh, has a problem. And then if we surgically remove that, then we weaken that system even further. The gallstones are gone temporarily, but then that problem will manifest elsewhere and maybe go to the heart or so. So that is a serious uh, issue. Um, so if possible, uh, that's why in Chinese medicine, of course, that knew very little surgery, there was some, um, you try and not do surgery and injure the integrity of the whole of the human body, but try and find ways to uh, rectify the situation and expel those stones with, for instance, the herb rhubarb, da huang, uh, is a very good uh, expeller of, of stones. And the second question was? Um, the effect uh, let's see, the um, uh, gallbladder decision-making, um, ah, yes. how, how do we understand that? And I'm going to ask a follow-up question about orbs of a flow of chi that surround particular organs and, and ask you to differentiate, uh, as you started to do in your answer here, uh, and make and you know, clarify the fact that the Wutsang, the five organs, are not just the physical organs. Yes, the, that is extremely important. You know, just like we have this dichotomy of energy versus matter that is both brought together in this character Qi, uh, that is both uh, energy in matter, energy that produces matter, energy that's contained in matter. It, it binds those two polar things in our postnatal world together. Um, there is this, this um, uh, the, 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 the Chinese medicine is a system of functional medicine basically that is primarily energetic. So when we diagnose, we diagnose function and energy Whereas Western, but not exclusively, we look at the actual organs as well, the, the structural organs. 
but more as a mirror to see what's wrong with the energy of the body. And in Western medicine, you know, using blood tests, using x-ray, using uh, those kinds of things, exploratory surgery, you look at the structure of the body. And of course, this is the thing we see in clinical practice all the time, that the, 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 the patient says, I have all these problems. And the doctor says, you just fine. You just imagine that you need to go and see a psychiatrist because you may be depressed or so. But uh, from a Chinese perspective, this is not so because there is an energetic blockage or disturbance that has not translated into the realm of the physical yet. Um, so absolutely, yes, therefore, if I understood the question correctly, is the, the organ systems of Chinese medicine, they are primarily energetic and functional, and they contain the physical reality of the organs, but we cannot use the structural model of Western medicine to to, to look at Chinese medicine, because then we're losing, like, in other words, we can't go like, bring me your blood work, all oh, your triglycerides are out of whack, uh, I'm going to treat the liver in Chinese medicine, or you've got purulent nephritis, kidney infection, uh, therefore I'm gonna treat the kidneys. That's not what we do at all. Chinese medicine is an independent, energy-based, function-based science where I take a look at your pulse and ask you a question, where does it hurt? How does it hurt? When does it hurt? To diagnose, oh, the problem is in the gallbladder or it's, and then start treating, treating from there. And I might be treating the lung, but my kidney infection now is going away. Uh, so that, that doesn't mean that these are two completely different systems, but uh, as you can see, you cannot do without the Chinese gallbladder because it means so much more. It includes, of course, the functions of the physical gallbladder, but then so many other things that in the Chinese worldview are related. And um, coming back to that question of the, the decision-making, Zhuangzi chapter 19 how did that person decide to move forward, that craftsman Qing, to was by not thinking I want to create it like this and make it look like a BMW, but I just go into nature, I fast, I become empty. And then out of this emptiness within me stands up this form that wants to be born. And so, that's the original meaning. It's not some ego that says, uh, I want to, to win or I want to overpower other kinds of people or I want to win this, this uh, battle like in, in the movie Braveheart or so. That is part of the gallbladder too. But the deepest meaning of it, I think, is this these spontaneous that during fasting, during meditation, when all of a sudden you go like, this is the right thing to do. This kind of rectification where I am at one with the vibrations of the universe and base my actions upon, upon that, that is real decision-making. Mm, thank you, Heiner. Um, uh, one of the questions want, uh, is a request uh, for you to share some stories from your clinical practice, uh, uh, demonstrating how you put this vast amount of uh, knowledge uh, base and practice base that you have into uh, specific uh, treatment with patients. If you can maybe just share one or two of those that would uh, demonstrate how you do Yeah, that. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is, is you know, the, the in, as Liu Liu Hong, the author of the classical Chinese medicine says that one of the most important thing in the transmission of not just Qigong and other Qi based practices, but particularly Chinese medicine is the concept of lineage and discipleship. Meaning you can't just download a bunch of data and cram that and then think I, I'm able to practice that but you need to, on the deepest possible level, uh, 
feel the rightness of it and get that, you know, that, that con concept of transmission in certain ways. And that is why observation is so important and why my first aha experience came me following my teachers around and seeing them do amazing things. That's why the first story I want to share is one to honor one of my herbal teachers who uh, I was in clinical observation and, and later practice with in the Sichuan countryside, where at one point cleared a, a testicular cancer patient who had a, a you know, metastasized tumor in his lower abdomen that was pressing on the lymph, giving him enormous edema and Western medicine had exhausted all of their methods and said, you basically, you have six months to live. And uh, so he came to see my teacher who was having a practice in a little alley uh, after post-retirement. And he was just living in that alley, the patient was, and uh, didn't say anything about the cancer. Just said, I have this edema in my leg, can you fix that? And it's a little bit of a typical Chinese thing to maybe test the doctor or you didn't want to go too much into it. And so he, while I was observing that, he, he was treating him with Li uh, Tang basically, which is uh, a decoction that's called tonify the center decoction. And the edema started going down and down. And after six months, it was gone. And one time the patient comes in and says, I have to tell you something, my actually, I never told you about this, but I'm actually a cancer patient. And uh, I didn't think if these famous professors at the Western Medicine University couldn't do anything, uh, you wouldn't be either. So I just wanted you to treat the symptom uh, because I didn't think you could do anything about the, the, the cancer. And now that it was gone, I went back to the Western Medicine University and took uh, uh, all their scans and they said, you cancer free, there is no more problem. So there is this, you know, my teacher therefore healing using diagnosis of energetic systems without having any Western diagnosis, healing cancer without even knowing that the patient had cancer. And so this is something that we see in our practice and that we teach in our clinically based program. Like I always tell my students, you know, that I'm a synologue by training and I'm intellectually got very excited, sometimes overexcited by these ancient concepts, but I'm teaching you that not just because I find it interesting because it'll make you a better doctor, you know? So don't get mesmerized by the wonders of Western medicine and think you are much less than that, you have a different kind of science that has something that is based in this chi way of looking at the body. Uh, uh, you look at energy first, when you diagnose, you diagnose energy. And when you treat, you treat the energy. And then the body, you know, energy leads, matter follows. And, you know, so you undo physical problems not by surgery or removal of the structure thing because the energy is still there. That's why you get metastasis because the energy hasn't been removed. But if you change the energy, even if you know nothing about the structural blockage, structure will follow energy and uh, that structural block will also slowly, slowly over time then melt away. So we see lots of those kinds of patients also in our clinic. We specialize, my team here, we have like five or six people together in my clinic uh, in the treatment of difficult and recalcitrant diseases where Western medicine says, we don't know how to diagnose that or we know how to diagnose it, but if we just give you a label like Parkinson's or MS, and it is uh, then, then uh, you know, um, not, uh, uh, there isn't much that we can do. We can give you the di diagnosis and a bunch of uh, drugs that often have severe side effects 
Um, so those kind of people come to us and we then work on prolonging uh, their lifespan or in some instances, completely reversing the conditions. Like I'm right now seeing a person who has uh, uh, chronic leukemia and is in a, in a group of people of 200 leukemia patients. And after I've treated that person for 15 years, the doctor said, well, your blood values are completely, you're completely in remission and your blood values are completely normal after we've really stopped treating you for 10 years now. And uh, you're the only one of my 200 patients who is in that boat, you know, you, so that, that is something that Chinese medicine can do uh, with its own science that is energy and functional medicine based and, and, and has a science behind it, diagnostic and therapeutic science that's extremely complex and treats, you know, through acupuncture, through massage, through qigong, through breathing, through visualization, through the emotions can have a very profound uh, influence uh, on uh, particular organ networks, particularly if that is orchestrated by the physician. If you say, oh, this is problem is in the gallbladder channel. And uh, you know, like that leukemia patient I just mentioned, her problem was in the, um, in the bladder channel. By the way, the multiple myeloma that we heard about earlier, we have also several patients like that. Most often they are bladder pathology patients, but that has nothing to do with the Western bladder and urinary problems, but it has to do with the bladder channel going up on the side of the spine and governing the bone marrow. And uh, therefore through acupuncture and Qigong and especially herbs in our clinic, we often able to, to, to expand uh, the lifespan of those kinds of patients considerably beyond the expectations of the Western doctors. And occasionally, even like in the case of this leukemia patient, uh, bring people into com complete uh, remission. Um, thank you, Heiner. Um, I'm gonna, uh... Uh, ask a couple of other questions that um, move out uh, move out of China and look for some cross cultural comparisons. Um, well, one's a very straightforward one, um, and one's a more philosophical one. So, uh, the first one is: Are the twelve pitches that you're talking about sound and vibration? Are I'm glad you recognize them. They're very very important. Um, dimensions of our of our existence and they do go back the recognition of them uh, 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 in China goes back um, in the recorded uh, literature at least 2500 years uh, the, um, yeah, the the Zhuang's the 19 story that you mentioned actually is about a man who carves wooden bell stands into which you hang the bells the, or the gongs uh, that you showed us a picture of that were used in Chinese courts and court rituals. So sound is extremely important. Are the, are the 12 pitches equivalent to the 12 tones in the Western diatonic scale? That's the, that's the shorter question, I think. And uh, the longer question, uh, more philosophical uh, and comparative question is, would you compare qi and its relationship to the Tao with tantric and Vedic descriptions of Shakti and its relationship to uh, Brahman or oneness. Do you see a correspondence between yin and yang and Shiva Shakti and their relationships to the merging of the two to experience this unity or oneness? So that's a, that's a, a very philosophical question. Um, there's also the very uh, practical question of sound. Uh, Let's start maybe it whatever I start with a simpler one. Yes, the the the, <laughs> the 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 there have been particularly the German musicologists during the 1950s or perhaps even earlier, uh, like um, Kuttner, for instance, has linked these exact 
the Western musical scale, the 12 notes of that directly to those pitch standards. And in the one slide that I had, you saw like, you know, F and D and C, it was linked to, to those different standards. However, it, and this is something I'm not enough of a music expert there, even though my parents forced me through the regular German, play the piano and the recorder and trumpet and all of these things, but I, I never kept it up. And, and, and it's a little bit like math to me. It's, it starts, particularly the theoretical aspects of dizzy. So dizzying. So if I read Kuttner and he's explaining how it's the same and how it's not the same, I, my mind is not smart enough to, to be able to follow him there. Uh, and, or maybe I don't have enough background knowledge there in the world of music. But uh, on the surface, there seems to be a direct correspondence. And as for the second question, I think absolutely yes. I think while, of course, in China itself, and I had one of these slides, I think I deleted it, uh, was, you know, in, in these Qigong texts where it says, oh, they, they, they translate Qigong in the West as Chinese yoga. Well, this is of course not true, you know, because number one, Qigong has nothing to do with anything from India and uh, yoga is some kind of weird woo-woo stuff. Uh, whereas Qigong, our Qigong is number one, entirely Chinese and number two, entirely scientific and has nothing to do with this Indian woo-woo science. Uh, from the cross-cultural perspective, the little bit that is more sort of, a, I'm not an expert in that, but I always like to look at Egypt and Sumer and even the ancient Greeks. I mean, the 12, whole map of the 12, for instance, we've got the 12 natives in Egypt, or the 12 anthropomorphized gods of Egypt set up powers in nature. We have that in China and find that then in the 12 meridians of the human body. In Egyptian medicine, we have 12 vessels in the body in which is supposedly, according to the Western translator, air. Well, the term for air and qi are the same in China. So the, 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 the Egyptian uh, medicine also had a concept of microcosmic 12 vessels through which qi is circulating. And when I read Indian materials, even though that is not my specialty at all, I see complete resonance with the Chinese record on all levels. So I think these concepts here are primordial. We see them expressed here in this lecture today through the lens of China and the terminology and the symbolism of China. But those concepts were similar to people all over the world and are expressed in different names and forms elsewhere and don't differ very much at all, I find. Thank you, Heiner. Um, we're coming to the end of our time here and I really hope we can continue our discussions together. Many of you can join us for other um, opportunities to draw out some of the, uh, there's just, uh, there's just so many things uh, that you touched upon that are really important. Um, uh, maybe, uh, as a final question, um, let's see, where did it go? Um, so, uh, and this kind of pertains partly to the difference between uh, the a TCM, it may not be clear to everybody, um, the difference between a traditional Chinese medicine and classical Chinese medicine and the, the traditions of classical Chinese medicine uh, how far back in time they go, the the compared to the the TCM traditions, and um, the the question then I think relevant to this that uh, one of our students asked is, uh, as you said, a lot of Chinese medicine is taught through Western perspective. Uh, the question is in the reverse way: How, if at all, can we incorporate elements of Chinese medicine practice into Western medicine? I think this is, yeah, this is the a, a super important question. And the, this is what I most talk about to my own students about is 
we get sort of as modern people, whether we live in China or the West really, uh, particularly in urban centers, we get brainwashed, uh, not just in a, in a negative sense, but we upload the hard drive with all of this materialist way of looking at the world, biochemistry, anatomy, uh, et cetera. And so when we then touch something that is different like Chinese medicine, that is energy philosophy and cosmology and, and where a formative energy is forming matter and determining the, the outlook and the behavior of matter, uh, there is a, uh, the, 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 there is not only tragic misunderstandings that you have and missed opportunities in, 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 in Western medicine, but uh, what you just mentioned with TCM versus a more classical approach means that even most modern practitioners of Chinese medicine who purportedly practice something different from Western medicine they use a materialist mindset to, uh, to, to approach the medicine. And they go like, oh, show me your blood work. Oh, I don't, didn't bring it. Well, then I, I first need to have, that's at least in China, you know, very often the Western diagnosis is asked about first, oh, I have got high cholesterol, high triglycerides. Well, let's move your liver qi and tonify your liver yin. That's sort of the, the usual angle here. Uh, and it still works, you know, uh, but it's, it's, it's a clinical effects are much less than if I use this original Chinese science of uh, categorizing energy. And so that's why I find it important for my students in our very much clinical doctoral program to first learn about Chinese cosmology and philosophy to sort of unbrainwash yourself or to, to open up your mind that there's a different way of looking at the world and then also at the body uh, to, to not, uh, because otherwise you only practice Chinese medicine at 5% of its potential. The remarkable thing is that even at that barefoot doctor level, you know, that was the barefoot doctor movement in the 60s after the, 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 the Russians took the entire medical infrastructure with them after building up Western medicine hospitals and universities in China. And then after demonizing it for many decades, Mao Zedong remembered the values of Chinese medicine, but was still highly suspicious of it as a materialist and said, we need to strictly you know, just just educate some of these, you know, uh, even illiterate peasants, nothing complicated, no philosophy, just, you know, for this problem, use this remedy. For this headache, use these points. And then that kind of practicing of Chinese medicine has survived to the present day in the form of so-called TCM, as the Chinese government likes to call it. And we've sort of you know, whether call it Taoist traditions or call it um, classical Chinese medicine, this is just an attempt to have a counterpoint to say we are basing our diagnostic and therapeutic science on this ancient Chinese model of the 12 organ networks of the body and we diagnose from there and we treat from there. Uh, and that is something that would be extremely useful for a Western medicine practitioner to expand the mind of, uh, and I think, you know, a lot of you are neuro, you know, experts in neural science. So you already in the realm of physics and energy and elect bioelectromagnetism, it's much easier for you to understand these concepts. Whereas if, if for an anatomy, you know, the people we see, are older people with complex diseases that come in with literally 25 orange bottles with this pill for this problem and that pill for that problem, where you just structurally biochemically try to suppress certain symptoms. And if you get side effect from one drug, use another drug to suppress that again. And so here, 
there are tremendous opportunities of looking, using the mindset of Chinese medicine to even practice Western medicine. There was a famous physician called Zhang Xichun during the 1930s who took Western drugs and classified them energetically uh, and, you know, like, uh, and even combined Western drugs with Chinese herbs, like he had one decoction that's called aspirin jia shi gao tang, which is aspirin plus gypsum decoction. Uh, so that is sort of like a truly classical approach where you, where you say, why not use CT scanners and even antibiotics or so, but I want to understand them, not biochemically, I want to understand them energetically through my lens. And then a whole nother door opens up how I could be using these things on a patient. Those are just some things that come to mind here. Well, that, that's fascinating. Um, and maybe just one, I'm gonna take the opportunity to ask you one final question. You're, are you okay with the translation of chi as energy or vital energy? Um, and um, aren't there some properties of chi that are, are maybe different from our Western concepts of energy? Um, one of the a little bit of research I haven't published yet, but I've, I've looked at um, various predicates that are associated with chi compared to shun or you know, often translated as spirit, or Jing, uh, vital essence, um, or Jing Shen together. And one of the things that comes through loud and clear, looking at the predicates in these philosophical cosmological Taoist texts that I study, is that Qi um, is often associated with predicates of fluid motion. So there's something about Qi which may be a little different than in energy, but are you comfortable with uh, energy or vital energy as a translation. Um, Manfred Porker concluded in 1965 when he provided all of these translations of different types of qi that uh, indeed the, you know, of course it was the, the, the 60s and uh, everybody at that time, including him even, who was like a super self-declared aristocrat and bow tie kind of a person, even he went underwent a hippie phase. Uh, so the, the, the new age movement has influenced that uh, terminology perhaps, but uh, uh, he concluded that the term energies and, and, and I think vital energy even better uh, is of all the options that there are is the best translation for chi. However, um, the, the important thing is to know that there are different kinds of qi, you know, with the highest form there being shen qi, which is this spirit qi that you were mentioning, and jing qi, which is a more dense and material type of version of that qi. Shen really, if you write, the, the, the literal meaning means you take that qi and you stretch it out then it becomes Shen. You bring it to a point, you make it denser, it becomes Jing, but it is the same Qi. And uh, so if there's only one, the difference, and you know that better than anyone, you definitely, my favorite translator of the ancient Chinese record is there are so many words that any one of these terms, Shen or Jing or Qi can be translated into the Western language and James Legge ran into that problem already a hundred years ago, like uh, Kubni in his dissertation on Qi uh, lists like five different ways in which Legge translates Qi depending on context. So he, he did it that way. Um, so I think vital energy is great as long as we are aware that there are different realms where that vital energy can play out in a very ultra, ontological, philosophical realm, a spiritual realm, a physical realm, an emotional realm, a psychological realm, etc. That's a wonderful um, uh, way to uh, bring um, our lecture and seminar to an end um, and uh, to look forward to future conversations to continue to draw out 
the, the implications of this very rich uh, lecture you've given us. Thank you very much, uh, Heiner. Thank everybody uh, for coming. A special hi and thanks to Kathy's sister, Sarah, who's uh, uh, with us. Hi, Sarah. Um, and uh, really uh, a deep appreciation uh, to all of you uh, for joining us and especially for Heiner. Please everybody be well, uh, stay safe. Uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you um, in the coming year. <laughs>